could not believe for one moment that in country the total stranger in the world, and that stranger comes and plays a part in my life, that he cannot come unless my father calls him. And I and my father are one. I am the father, and the father in me. So that no one comes into my life and plays any part in my life of what I am doing, good, bad, or indifferent. He just can't come. Well, man is big enough of him to accept that way in simple. Can Christ set up that far to encompass the whole vast world? And that everything that is happening in his individual life, he is the cross of it. He can't quite select these events when they are touched by living beings in the world to anything that he inwardly has ever done. He cannot do it one more. But I say, you be the judge. Whether you believe it or not. For he said, I know everyone from the very first. Why did he know everyone from the very first? But who is he that you know this? Are we not told? What brought to know the man's thoughts? Except the spirit of the man which is in him. No man knows the man's thoughts except the spirit of the man which is in him. But who is the spirit in you? I tell you, it's Jesus Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Read it in the second chapter, the 20th verse of Galatians. I've actually been crucified with him. And it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. For the Spirit in me knows you from the beginning that I believe it or not. So I took you this night, do I believe it? To my extent, will I believe this is all of liberty? That not a thing is happening that I didn't cross, not a thing in my world. Well, who betrayed me now? I knew the one who had betrayed me. But no one can betray me unless he has my secret. But no one. You can't betray a man unless you know the man's secret. And to know the man's secret, you'd have to be the spirit of that man. So who could betray a man but himself? So no man can destroy my life. I lay down myself. The power to lift it up and the power to lay it down again. So no man. It's for my life. So he knew the one who would betray him and should betray him because he is himself. He is self betrayed. He knows the secret to the point where everything is happening in this world because he is the sole cause of all the things that he encounters, that experiences, that is to the cause. He knows it. And so he is betrayed. The Creator's played within himself. He knows what is the cause of it. He's found it in himself. His own utterly human imagination is the Christ spirit in him that really is the cause of the phenomenon of his life. He knows it. And so now he's self betrayed. He will show it to the world, but who will accept it? He will tell it to the world, and so they will themselves judge to what extent they will go with him. And when he comes to the statement that no man can come unto me except the Father who sent me draws him, we draw the line of that. Now let me share with you what has been given to me. The gentleman is here tonight, and this is his story, as given me last Tuesday night after the meeting. Then, a 
I went back and put on my own shoes and tried to match that feeling which I had imagined to be Stevenson's feeling as he felt having produced a good story. That was the technique that he employed. It always happened while I was taking my morning walk. When I came home, I began to list point by point to my wife on what I thought was wrong with the story. And then, point by point, I saw someone standing behind me and prompting me. And suddenly, the solution to each point came into my mind. Just as if someone was standing behind me and prompting me. And the whole of it came into my mind point by point. Now he said, I should add that while I was gone, my wife had imagined wonderful things are happening. Wonderful things are happening. Wonderful things are happening. She said, I was not sure that your wife would understand. But when a man is at home day in and day out, a woman has to use generalizations, sweeping generalizations. So she would understand that because my wife and I spent the 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we are in the same place. And so he, the writer, uses his home. Now, if I use my home. So, with that confession on, he said about an hour, about an hour later, I was in the shower. And I was pleasantly recalling an experience of six years ago. Recalling this thing that happened six years ago, when a story was being or it seemed to be dictated to me in a light manner. The thing that just happened, as someone standing behind me and dictating the story of this past hour, and it seemed six years ago, as I recall the story, that this happened in a light manner. Some presence dictated or seemed to dictate the story. And then, it hit me like a sledgehammer. For the story of six years ago was this, that central character in the story of six years ago was Eddie. Identical, done to a T. It was Eddie. And then, if you were here when we told the story of Eddie, let me now tell you the character that he conceived six years ago. He said he was mildly insane. Well, you know, Eddie was committed to an insane asylum for those who were mildly insane. He said the character was periodically picked up and released by the police. Well, the police picked up Eddie and went to the asylum wouldn't take him back. The police didn't want him, and so the police released him. He said, for plot reasons, I gave the character a limp in the right foot the right leg. So has any a limp in the right leg. He said, the people of the town of the character treated him in the way that the people in my neighborhood treat any. The character lived in a tent outside the town. And he lives today in a tent up in the hills of Hollywood. The character wore the kind of clothes, the same clothing that Eddie wears. The character had a fascination with atomic fallout. In fact, he perpetrated a hoax upon the town and almost scared the daylights out of him and it wanted to lynch him. Eddie has the most unusual fascination for atomic fallout and tells me he has a pipe that when he rubs it with some other piece of metal, he can cause atmospheric disturbance on any part of the earth. And it disturbs him because he feels his misuse of this light, which he calls his space needle, is the cause of the unrest in parts of the world, like Cyprus, for instance. So he's had to restrain himself. He has probably buried this pipe on the desert which, said the writer, is perhaps safer than where he usually keeps it under my house. <laughs> and 
Israel the same intense interest. But he said, this is the amazing similarity between these two, that the feeling I always had for the character is identical to the feeling I had for Andy. Now, he said, I didn't tell this story to my wife immediately. I wanted to test it. And so I began to tell her and describe to her a story of a character. And I purposely omitted the link in the right leg, because had I said it, she would instantly have thought of Eddie. So I didn't mention that characterization. Then I omitted completely from my vocabulary the use of the words unwanted and rejected, which, by the way, in describing this character, he felt himself unwanted and rejected. But in spite of these omissions, she said to me, you were talking about Eddie. And then, said he, I was stunned that my wife, from a description of a character I conceived six years ago, could see in that character and not see that character. But I'm talking only of one character. She knows it's Eddie. So I really should sign this letter worried. For the simple reason, having written all my life, I created some characters that I am in no hurry to meet in the flesh. <laughs> so, if you understand that, then you don't want it. Of course, I could return to your book, The Learn the Promise, and reread the chapter. Um, there is no fiction. And now, said he, with this of my chest, as it were, I must say something good in favor of an outside God and candles. So in my present state of mind, I think that really such a thing, an outside God, would be more comforting than to be the God creating all of these things that's coming into my world. When I reflect upon the characters as a writer, I have conceived and projected on the screen characters that I don't really want to meet in a hurry, but in the flesh. Then he said, I thought you'll keep this letter in a safe place. Because if I ever were proof for insanity, I would have it. You keep it in a safe place, and the day I need it to prove my insanity, for there is the proof. For here, this one, this judgment, has gone all the way, and is willing now from his confession in this letter to admit that the character Eddie, that simply came by accident after a great rainstorm, that all the clouds were rough in the neighborhood, and Eddie had no job for the day, and coming his way up the hill, up to where he lives in his tent, this gentleman very kindly gave him a lift, and the friendship began there. Because outside of this friendship, which he said is the same intense feeling he has for him that he had for his character, and he always had for the character. They have no social meeting point. They do not travel in the same social circle, intellectual circle, financial circle. Yet, there is a close of feeling, I'm quite sure, towards this baby that he has towards maybe nine tenths of those who were in his circles. And he created Eddie. So I said that everyone, you may not recognize the character. Maybe you're not a writer. And have written to the point where you can remember an actual character that you created out of the nowhere and had it produced and saw the production yourself and knew that was to see the character that he remembered. And then he ran into the flesh and blood character that he conceived six years before. So the sixth chapter of the book of John No one can come unto me unless the Father who was sent me draws him. The last day, I will lift him up. I will raise him up at the last day. So I'll tell the shepherd exactly how he's going to raise him up. The day will come, and the last day doesn't mean the last day of 24 hours. It means the last day of the journey from the cradle to the grave, and it is your last time around. And you are not on the field of the cause anymore. And when that last phase comes to an individual, he will have this experience. When you least expect it, 
you know, I have to tell you about it, and maybe what I'll tell you now, you'll forget and quickly forget. So when it happens, it will come as a very wonderful death of surprise. The copy of the memory that you heard it from my lips. But about it. You don't know about it, you never read about it, no one told you about it. And one night, all they come through the day. But in my case, it always seems to come at the wee hours of the morning. And so, you will be suddenly twisted from within yourself with a corkscrew and show your skull you will go. And you will be clothed in the most glorious body of fire and air. It's that luminous. You need no stars, no sun, no moon to illuminate your path. And a heavenly cross will call your name, whatever your name is. And they will pronounce the name and say, he is risen. Not he is risen, but the name. So your name is John. John is risen. John is risen, they'll repeat it. And then this chorus will sing up, the most glorious heavenly chorus will sing. Your praise because you have been risen. And then you will come upon a sea of infinite imperfection, human imperfection. The limit of any will be there. The blind, the heart, the river, everything you conceived are taking human form. And they're waiting for you, their redeemer, to redeem them. And as you glide by, you seem to glide by, everyone will be transformed into the image of perfection. You do not raise a finger to make it so. Blind people become those of perfect sight, the deaf here. The limb, the heart, the river, the all cease to be what they were as you pass by. And when you come to the very end, and the last one is finished, and all are perfect, then the same heavenly cause will exult and ring out, it is finished, the last cry on the cross. And then you, for unfinished business, will be turning here to complete it, to tell it, ready to leave it in a more permanent form, in the form of a picture, or a story, but you will tell it in a more permanent form, then you yourself have that one of experience, because forever as far as you are concerned, but you will tell it for the benefit of others, and scream it out as it were. Return here to complete the few remaining years, for your end is at hand. Every one has to be raised that you were created. Every one has to be transformed into perfection to confirm to you when you were lifted up at that very moment you were perfect. And so as you walk by, you molded them in harmony with the perfection springing within you. And you do it without effort, without taking thought. You are above the conceptual mind. You're not concerned about these people. You simply walk by knowing in the depth of your soul it is all perfect, and every one is reshaped and molded in harmony with that perfection springing within you. So you're told, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will lift all men unto me. I will shape them and transform them. And so no man came, save I called him. If I called any, they will leave. And then that will serve me well. I'll take him ashore. And suddenly I'm presently recalling a story of six years ago. When I recall it and develop my sudden it dawns upon me what I've been walking around this past two years in the company of one that I myself have created and I didn't recognize it. Here is a man in my own way. And for two years he's been in my life. And the kingdom of my world. And I didn't recognize my own creation. Well, that's what the world does all day long. It draws only its own, but doesn't recognize its own creation. No man cometh unto me, save I call him. For my father and I alone. So he can't come unless my father draws him. He can't come unless I draw him. For I am my father alone. And so I've drawn every being into my world. God or in so when I think he is not, and he crosses my path, knowing you and I, he is not good, you can't trust him. Where in my world do I go back to that moment of mistrust in me, when I really couldn't trust myself? I thought I was afraid of my own behavior if given an opportunity. If I thought I would get away with it, I might. But I may not be allowed but to sit down and write the story. I can enact the story. I could walk through a store. And if no one really had eyes upon me, I thought they didn't, I might contemplate with pleasure an act that if caught would be quite embarrassing to those who loved me. 
I tell them it's certainly not the building of Abraham, but to encourage every person in this world to forgive every being in this world. Because you have a cause on the behavior of everyone you are observing in this world. And I tell it in a most meaningful manner because it's not home forcefully. And I was severely criticized by the audience for it, and criticized the following month by the wife of the gentleman who brought me to this town to give a series of lectures. And she never I thought that was very, very unbecoming. And so many have criticized you for it. They've written me letters, and I can tell you about them. Many of them are letters I received that are very, very critical of what you said from the platform. I said, I didn't say for any purpose other than to show everyone that they are the cause of the misbehaviors of others that they condemn. They are the cause of it. And so I tried to explain to her that it is not condemnation of the person. I was putting myself, I was the cause of her arrest, the cause of her action. And this is the story. I was married and separated for 15 years. No divorce and no final separation, no legal separation, but separated. I was married at the age of 18, father of 19, separated at 20. And then for the next 15 years, we lived our separate lives and only saw each other when she was driving me to court for non payment of alibi. That's the only time we ever saw each other. I always came out of the court with a reduction. Always. One after the other. So, seven times before the job and seven times they went on this way. The time she knew that without taking any more, there's nothing else to get. You get nothing the next time. And so that was the picture. So I told that story. All these things are happening. And one day, I knew I wanted to get married to a certain party, who is now the mother of my daughter. But I had all this entangled personal life. I was separated legally. You can't get divorced in New York City, so say, on one grounds, no arcade law in the world. Therefore, nothing but collusion goes on in the courts, divorce courts in New York City. So I thought they get forced upon man because of the arcade law. But I wanted my divorce. And then she was told by a very close, intimate friend of mine that I wanted that divorce and to really leave town, get out of town. But my friend didn't want me to get a divorce and marry the girl that I eventually married. So I thought, all right, I will now apply this law. And I stepped this though I was happily married to the girl who now bears my name. And at the end of a week, my dancing partner, who I thought was the one who had been told her to fly, she was, came to me and told me that she had come as a brother. Just a brother. She could never marry me because it was not that feeling towards me. But that made me very happy. And then the other one was gone now, never to be done again. So the girl would think. But I still stepped in the assumption I was happily married. And one morning the phone rang. As I answer the phone, it's the court, courtroom calling. This is the federal building, said yes. Are you there for daughter? Yes. Are you in the public speaker post by the name of Neville? I said yes. Well, now you've got to be in court next Tuesday morning at 10. Now, I was too sleepy to ask why. And so, next Tuesday morning, just a little before 10, here, the phone rings again. Are you there for daughter? I said, yes. And why aren't you in court? Did the big call you last Tuesday to tell you to be in court today? I said, why should I be in court? What's wrong that I should be in court? I have been subpoenaed. They say, this party over a while, you're a proper character. And the reporters are always in court. And they'll have to get this bit of story into the papers. And the papers today. Well, I said, what's wrong? I said, well, your wife happens to be on trial. And so if you would come on down, I would maybe even throw some light upon this. So I went on down. According to the courtroom, just in time to see them bring up into the dock. Three judges came in, took the position, and then sent one whisper to one judge, and then the boy said, Is Mr. Goddard in the courtroom? I said, I'm there. Would you take the stand if I'm swearing up on the road? But maybe it would help us to throw a little light here. And so I took the stand. And they asked me if we were the same religious faith. They said, no, she was born a Catholic. I was born a Protestant. But that's no problem. She is not a Protestant Catholic, and I'm not a Protestant Protestant. So there's no problem, no problem at all. And then he said, well, then, could you throw some light? I said, first of all, she is eight years my senior. And, you know, my age, before 
we must turn her page. She's undoubtedly passing through some emotional disturbance, and so that a woman is passing through space, well, we can do any irrational thing. What she's now charged with, I'm quite sure she's never done it before. Even if you have the evidence to support it, I still say she's never done it before. I will swear she'll never do it again. I ask you for my son's sake, who lived with me, that if you pass the sentence, that for the law's sake, sentence her, but then be merciful and suspended. He said, I've never heard a plea in this court of mine, similar to that, in all my years on the bench, to the man who had nothing to gain by this merciful plea of his. When you leave, you went to the boss to help you up all that happened before us, taken from your life when she was in jail for this past week, waiting for this dead file. He said, I'll act upon your recommendation, Mr. Gunn. I have offended you for six months and suspended, and you ever come before me again. Mary met me in the lobby. He said, that was a very decent thing of you to do, Devil. Give me the papers. I said, I don't have any papers with me. Come on, I don't think. We were up together. First time in these many, many years, we were the closer than between the judge and the bench. We were together to my hotel. And I gave her the papers. I had not been able to serve for unnumbered months. Here were the papers. And we got my divorce uncontested. So I told that story to say that I called her to do what she did. And I not assumed that I was free to marry the girl that now bears my name. She would never have done these things at all. And so she goes into a store, and the first time in her life she picked up something that she hadn't paid for. And someone saw it. And so it was a silly thing. But nevertheless, she did it. And that's what brought her into the city that I could find her. And she was moved to ask me to give her the papers because I pleaded for her. And so having done all this, who actually was the culprit? I was the culprit. She came right into my world to play a certain part, to grant me my freedom. I'm speaking of the law of liberty. And so, should she be condemned for an act when I, the unseen author, wrote for? I didn't write it out. I said, I'm not writing a for you, but I determined the behavior of that body, that she had to do something in order for no help to take the papers from me. And so I tell you only to show that don't condemn anyone. You and you alone are the author of the things happening in your life. And therefore, you will condemn a man that's getting right into his script and live in the right way. Here comes a man with a lip in the right way. He writes everything into an imaginary character, and he is the nicely at all. You can't distinguish between what the world calls the imaginary and the other. You can. This is all one. And so people could not go beyond a certain limit. And so you could say, well, I will assume that I am what I want to be. And things happen in my world like this. But don't tell me now that I actually created what in that character I did. And so many departed never to work with him again. Never. And so he turns now to the trial who remained. He said, would you go also? And Peter answered, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. But to whom is Peter speaking? He isn't speaking to another. Whoever is the character written in this drama, as Peter, came to that decision within himself. It's the most difficult thing in the world to accept, for this is the uh, cause of cessation. The cessation at that moment, because they would not accept the fact that they are actually the cause of these things that are living and moving in their world. Some crippled, some limited, some lame, and they are the cause of it. They will not accept it, you know, all right? They left him, never to work with him again. And then Peter said, but to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. These are true. And now to whom will I turn? For you know we have believed, and we have come to know you are the Holy One of God. No one will turn back now to Matthew when you see the answer. Who do people say that I am? 
Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah coming in. Some say Jeremiah. And some say a prophet of all. Doesn't respond to that. He asks another question. But whom do you say that I am? And Peter becomes a spokesman. And Peter answers, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed are you, Simon Bartim, for flesh and blood have not told you this, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. Oh, what is the Father in He said, I am the Father. And you see me, you see the Father. So who but the Spirit in man is revealing what Christ really is? No prophet come again. No reincarnation. But man has Christ living, and he's awakening. More and more and more. So the captain wrote the story concerning Eddie. Let me know up until now. I really wanted to wake up. A man tried to wake up. But now, I'm trying desperately to go to sleep again. I wonder if he doesn't want what he really doesn't live. He doesn't want what he's just discovered. There's an enormous responsibility to be responsible for the character that he has created. And the all of that in the air, and one after the other, will enter his circle and become an intimate, and one that he really is very fond of. One that he created and endowed him with all these strange things, a peculiar mental unbalance, and a limp in his right leg, and unwanted by society, and looked down by the neighborhood, putting him in a and ostracizing from society, and making unwanted and unwashed, and, well, repellent in many ways. And all these things he does to a character and falls in love with the character. So you can see the words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They're playing all these parts because they're magnificent of men and women are writing dramas. And the world is forever falling under the spell of the magnitude of men and women. No matter what the world is like, it's always falling under the spell of those who are awake who are writing intensely with emotion. So today, you try it. I hope that the chapter is yours. Don't tell me. But I hope you can go all the way. And don't tell anyone you can go all the way because the spirit in you, he knows. Well, you can really go all the way on your turn back tonight and take only a portion of it. But even a portion of it, take it. So there is no law, the law of the identical office. But the man is always so shabby queen. The promise of what it appears to be, these, you'll be with it. And you'll find in the end, everything is simply bearing witness to man, what man is doing. As breaks are linked to the heat and the wild, to the thorns and the thistles of the waste, and they tell me how they will be tired and driven out and compelled to chase. And you would not believe for one moment the play is telling us that the unwholesome suppressions of the normal natural urges of the animal bodies that we wear are the cause of the thorns and the thistles of the waste. The society is clamped down upon all the normal natural qualities of the human animal body, because these are animal bodies that we wear. And by putting a clamp upon the natural origins, then comes forms and thistles of the waste. And what Baptist would believe that? He doesn't believe that for one second. And he thinks he's going to kill them by some insecticide or some other kind of thing. And go up and go and ring, they all come back. As long as man walks the earth, who can impose these restrictions on growing healthy bodies and we call them moral laws. There's nothing in this world but man, because God is the only reality, and God is man. And man is God. So man is all in that creation, and God is man, and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is in our creation, and that is God himself. So I told you, whether you be a writer, as this chapter writes, and a thought he writes to ask the world to own the kind of mind that he earns from his own confession. And so he writes it, and not me, he just spot him. But he lived with it for two years before he realized he was his own creation. But now what he did to rectify this problem of the story, you can do it. Being a writer, he took a great advantage to write. Anyone who could write, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 
idea with that when you take Robert Louis Stevenson. And he can put his feet into the feet and the shoes of such the magic writer. And then, right behind him, someone. It was Stevenson. He called him by a mood. You can tell by the mood that you wear, who you're going to meet in this world. You wear moods, and they come. And he caught the mood. He wondered what would the mood be like? What would it be like? And who? Ask him who. He's asking what would Stevenson be like? How did he feel after he finished what he considered a good script, a good story? And having caught that mood, then he said, I thought I could buy own shoes. And then I tried to match my own feeling to what I had imagined Stevenson must have felt. And so when he got them, made it. And I do agree that's touching anything in this earth. It shall be established for them in this world. If two agree, I called the one with whom he wanted to agree. He moves. And then, as though someone stood behind him and dictated the solution of every thought that he brought the planet up, it all came into his mind. There'd be no problem to him for this man, a writer, to sit down and write it out. After they were all solved in his mind. Then, taking his shower, and feeling very happy about what had just happened, he very presently recalls and explains six years ago. And while he's contemplating it, it's like a sledgehammer on his head. Who would have thought he'd been walking around with his own creation for two years and didn't recognize it? And he didn't want to spring it on his wife before I'll test this press before I spring it on. And so he described the character, leaving out very definite things like the link in the right leg. And the use of the two words, I don't want it. Reject him. And maybe other things were different with him, she still could spot the character was alien. And so, that story you predicted on tonight, what would it be like if you want money? Well, I mentioned someone who had good enough it. What would it be like to him if he really wants money? Because many have it without any thought of money. But if someone really wants it, what would it be like if after you really break open a big thing and then you try to match your feeling to that which you imagine he must have felt when he made what he considered the big thing? Match the feeling and then just match it and see what happens. Just try it. What we're doing here is experiment because this is the greatest problem in the world. As far as said, the secret of imagining is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which everyone should aspire. First of all, infinite power is in it, unraveled, infinite wisdom, and infinite delight. So if it contains all of these, as we can unravel the problem, then why not try it? So we're asking everyone to try it, and then share with us, by each other, we'll share it. And I did this now with this Japanese fellow. Again, I repeat, I hope he keeps it up. And share with me, but I in turn I share with you, these properly lovely facets of this great diamond. For if he could put his imaginary feet into imaginary shoes and feel what the great Stevenson must have felt, then he was satisfied with the story. And then take the shoes off, find his own shoes, all his imagination, for he is taking his morning walk with all this is going through his mind. And people walking by will see a band walking by and Roughly ignoring what he never second thought, or the right one was in his mind. But no one but the spirit of that man would know. Who would know at the right moment that Stevenson was walking by? And while he was wearing the shoes of Stevenson, Stevenson was there. To the point that when you said to him, you would not see the man that was there, but his wife would see, you would see Stevenson. You really would. Because all things are not the guy in one another's being mingled. And so they are outside in space or outside in time. They're only as far away as you are them to be. And no one else can call them. Any being in this world. You can call anyone as they come from, knowing the same place. Call them by feeling that you see. Put yourself into his shoes and call him. And then, if you have a problem, as he has a problem, you have the same sensation as somebody standing behind you and prompting you. So the point by point of the solution is given to you, it comes right into the head. If you believe that Greg, who died 
died in 1827, when we saw the certain problem for you, feel the presence of blame. Because they're not pushed out as the world would think. So you think time, after 1827, you certainly found it any bit of brain with England. No one is there. And so they were only as far away as you let them be. So he went back and read the chapter on the no fiction. And this covered he the writer, and very humorously when he said in this letter, having lived all my life, I have created such characters. I assure you that I am no sorry to meet them in the flesh. But it doesn't matter. The day will come you will move up by a spiral motion when you least expect it. And without effort, work by and redeem every one of them. Every one will be forgiven for the party failure because they're created either wittingly or unwittingly. And so I ask you to join with me. Go to the test and then come to play your, with your letters. Bring them to me. There's as many as you possibly can that I may encourage others to try it too. From this, when you go home, read this chapter, the sixth chapter of the book of John. It really is the secession chapter. They all departed, never to walk with him again. And only the few remain. And he turned, and they said, Where we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed you. And we have come to know. It didn't come overnight. We have come to know you are the Holy One of God. For the Holy One of God is God Himself. You come to know it. But you are coming to a man. You found a creative presence within yourself. And although the world would try to make you feel that a creative presence is a power, speak of it as it. Don't personalize it. Oh, yes, you do. It's yourself you found. That's your person. So Christ is in you as the creative power in you. You are doing it. And you are a person. Therefore, Christ is a person. So if it's your Christ a person, you always talk about Christ as a creative power. He is the only person. He's the only person. He is the heavenly man. You're finding in yourself the heavenly man. The man that cannot die. The immortal you. And when you find him, don't let him go. Let everything else go. But don't let him go. So when Paul writes to Timothy, he said, I know who I have believed. Not that and he's speaking now of Christ, and yet he defines Christ as the power and the wisdom of God. And when he defined it as power and wisdom, he personifies it, personalizes it, because of himself, as we thought. He found to be himself. You'll never find him on the outside. And so, to what extent this time you can go with the testimony of Christ Jesus? Can you go all out and say that no man no one, male or female, can come unto me unless my Father who sent me draws it. And I will leave him up for the last day. Leave that section alone. That's going to happen anyway. But to what extent can you accept that testimony that no one can come unto me unless my Father who sent me draws it? And I and my Father are one because I am in my Father and my Father is in me. Can I go that far? And then you go all out that not one being in this world can cross my path. That I did not call. And those who come more intimately to my circle, they're really a thing I've been dwelling upon. You start dwelling upon the so called tyrants of the world and tormenting your mind for life. You find you don't forget to live in Russia. He lives right next door. Comes right in. And then you have to get rid of him. You've been creating in your mind's eye a certain something, and he comes right into your world. You draw them, and you draw them under the panel. Now, let us go into the silence. Everything in Scripture from beginning to end is all about you. Not the garment that you're wearing, but you, the wearer of that garment. Everything from beginning to end is your real autobiography. Much of it you have not yet experienced, but it still is yours to be experienced that was truly an autobiography. At the moment you may read it as a biography, but don't think it is a banana. It's all about you. The most insane revelation will prove itself true one day you experience it. 
It's all about him. When the child of God thought and he was quickly caught up into heaven, you'd have that experience. The child will vanish from those who would try to destroy it. And the all the destructive powers of the world are still begotten by you. All in a state of dream, when man was sung to sleep. So you were that being. I hope tonight you saw who Judas was. But some being who betrayed what the whole vast Christian world believes to be their law. No one could have betrayed a man unless he knew that man's secret. And no person knows a man's secret but the spirit of that man which is in the Holy Judas. And the word Judas means the praise of Jehovah. Judas is praise. But man thinks the drama took place 2,000 years ago. It's taking place. All the earth. So no man takes my life. I lay down myself. If no man takes my life, then what are you blaming a man for? I lay it down in every corner that moves upon the face of the earth. Unless I die, that can stop me. But if I die, I shall rise again and die with me. And so he became man, that man would become God. And he did it voluntarily. You can imagine who that's Christ. That's the power of God. And it is personified, though a power, because you're a person, therefore it is a person. Every evil act of the world needs a man as an agent, therefore it is a man. Every noble act needs a man as an agent, therefore it is man. So it's all personified. So the scripture personifies the powers. Yeah, that's right, they are powers. They are personified. Yes, sir. not just in the future, right from this platform, but we've answered. Some claim that man is constantly robbed by looking back or looking forward. He is so concerned about what he did and what he is going to do, what he finally encountered and what he hopes to encounter, and he admits with that everlasting person, which is all I am. So Christ defines himself as all I am, the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the bread of heaven. I am the true bride. I am the resurrection. All present. When man goes back and thinks of him as something past, and hope to meet him sometime in the future, and it's ever present, he only is in the present. So man is robbed by two things that he works with all day long because Christ is crucified here in the present. I have been crucified. I am crucified with Christ. And his mind who lives, but Christ who lives in me, is present. And his name is Jesus, is I am. The word Jesus is Jehovah, Jehovah is Yahweh of our faith, and it's defined as I am. So my feet to my left, my feet to my right, I'm always looking to the past or the future. I'm omitting the only reality of the rest, which is the present. And only what I am, I will reach his heaven. Only what I am, am I pulling up. So don't wait to assume that I am what I would be, because reason denies it. Ignore reason, ignore the facts of life, I'm dare to assume it, because all things are possible to I am. So the two things are with us morning, noon, and night. And we wonder, no wonder if I did the right thing at that cocktail party last night. Did I say the right thing? Did I make the right impression? And we worry all through the night, deep we really do it, that's a thief. And now, I'm invited to one tomorrow. I wonder if my right tongue will be tied, or do I have the nice dress when I'm handing over the hairdresser? And all these things, and I'm concerned about tomorrow. Then it's only today. This now. This is I am. Well, I see my time is up. So do just it. I'm sure that this might give us in the written form your results. Thank you.